welcome to our regular Board of Education meeting. Um, we will start the night with the administrative reports from our interim superintendent, Dr. Minsler. Thank you. Good evening and, and well, a special welcome to uh, Ms. Denise Marty, family and consumer science teacher at, at the middle school, along with some of her students who are here to present uh, to the board this evening. Uh, uh, professional development for teachers and administrators so, uh, took place yesterday in the district that was focused on self-care and wellness. Budget meetings commence today with the review of the Wells Road budget and will continue over the next few weeks. The high school vestibule project began on schedule last week and is going well. Work on the middle school roof continues and is expected to have all the roof panels up by the end of October and then finish trim work after that. Sixth grade students are going to the Boston Science Museum tomorrow. PTO Jogathon will be held at Kelly Lane this Saturday, October 19th. This is the PTO's major fundraising event. Congratulations to Carolyn Hall uh, from the middle school and from Lizzie Capelli, the senior at the high school, who were chosen as the Farmington Valley Superintendents Association Award winners. They will be recognized at lunch on November 8th uh, at the Farmington Country Club, at which Mrs. Henberry and Mr. Dunn and I will be attending. Uh, the district, um, uh, this is hot off the press, it's, the communication will go off tomorrow, but the district will be removing the after six ban on activities effective Monday the 21st. Um, area superintendents, I've been in contact with our respective health districts and so forth. And, despite the fact there has not been the killing frost that we have been looking for, um, that the, the, the risk is extremely low. We're just gonna advise people to make sure that they cover up and, and do forth. But uh, anyway, so all of us in the area are gonna do that and I'll be sending a communication about that tomorrow. Um, there will be no school on Tuesday the 5th for Professional Development Day. And I did send out a communication uh, to all parents and staff um, last week at the end of the week uh, that beginning this year when or if there is a need um, to uh, open school late that it will be a two hour delay rather than a 90 minute delay um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one because uh, half hour makes a difference. I've been in this business a long time and when it warms up a little bit uh, it, it, uh, the roads are better Two, we have people that are traveling in uh, who are staff from outside of Granby. And third, um, and probably the most importantly, um, both Hartford and Heartland students always have two hour delays. And so when they are delayed two hours and we were only delayed 90 minutes, it's an inequity. We wanted to write that. So in any case, got a lot of positive feedback and, uh, and the communication and but Let's hope that for your sake, there are no late openings or snow days, and then we won't have to even worry about that. At least not while I'm here. <laughs> and the next board meeting will be on November 6th. Thank you. Questions, comments for Mark? I have a comment. I think the two hour delay aligns us with every other school district, I think, in the Hartford County, and I appreciate the recognition that we have Heartland and Hartford students um, and teachers and parents um, who appreciate that change, so that would be my comment. We are going to skip over student representative reports, move it after the business manager's report, hopefully, and continue to delay it. Dwaritha is joining us from a night class in Farmington, and she is delayed, so we don't want her to rush. We will get to the student representative reports when Dwaritha gets here. Business manager's report, Anna. Thank you, and good evening. Um, as of September 30th, 2019, the Board of Ed shows a negative forecast of $197,000. Special education expenditures are uh, projected to be unfavorable, $321,000, and regular education expenditures at this time are projected to be favorable, $124,000. During the budgeting process, the Board of Ed projects expenditures for only those out-of-district placements and personnel needs that are known at the time. The driving factor for the variance in special education is the net change in the added district placements for students whose needs have changed um, since the budget um, was prepared for um, additional outplacements that were necessary. 
Um, so the spending in the regular education category is on target. Salaries and benefits represent 76% of the budget and show a slightly favorable forecast. Natural gas is projected to be um, slightly over budget, but is offset by a projected savings in electricity. Revenues to the town reflect a projection of additional revenue from regular education of just 15,000. Excess cost funding from the state, although higher than last month, is projected to be lower than budgeted. And that is um, because the out of district cost for special education, um, we have fewer students meeting the stop loss um, limits. So that's a, a little bit of a tricky calculation. Um, the remaining revenue items are, ex um, are expected to meet budget at this time. So we're early in the school year. All right, any questions, comments for Anna? I, I have a quick one. On the um, regular ed side, um, that 197,000, where is that coming from? So on the, the regular ed side is um, $124,000 uh, of the projection is regular ed um, of that loss. And let's just tell you that about 74,000 of it is in um, salaries right now and does that mean there's some we're not filling positions or no it just so when we budget um we budget with the information that we have at the time so um when we fill vacant positions we fill them at kind of the middle of the scale masters five um five years with the masters some come in lower um last year we had um folks uh, in fy19 we were higher this year we hired differently, so we were a little bit lower. Also, um, we had some savings in, um, we had one student that had a one-to-one -one placement who um, moved out of district, so um, we had some savings in that um, area as well. So that's in, that's in the, the salaries category. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mark, any comments? We review these in subcommittee and um, find them to be in order. We asked similar questions about the special ed expenditure. I'm keeping an eye on that. All right, seeing no Doritha, we'll move along to schools in the spotlight and welcome Miss Marti and some of her students from the Granby Memorial Middle School Family and Consumer Science class. Good evening. Thanks for having us. I am going to turn this quickly over to the folks that I brought with me. So this is Healthy Foods Bunch, and uh, we actually brought some healthy foods. <laughs> so if you listen attentively, we'll reward you with you. <laughs> uh, and we've got almost all of our group, or maybe we'll have one more student join us. Uh, we have two students from each grade level that were invited to attend. And Mrs. Marty, who is our family consumer science teacher, and she's done a great job shifting the program. Um, and I'm going to let her tell you about the three major components of the program. And the kids will tell you how they have learned in these different parts of the program. And if you have any questions, we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. This is exciting. Um, that's okay. Okay. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, but we do want to cover just what our main, um, the main topics or the main areas that we cover in middle school. Uh, during family consumer science time. I get to see all three grades, and each grade is exposed to um, those three areas that you see on the board. Um, each grade, it gets a little more intense and a little more involved. Uh, financial literacy covers a lot, a lot of information. Um, beginning with sixth grade, we investigate advertising techniques that help them uh, discover better ways to be consumers, being more aware of advertising techniques. Uh, seventh grade does a lot of work with um, entrepreneurship and investigating uh, the skills that are necessary to become an entrepreneur, if you'd like. Uh, nutrition part for um, most classes does, it grows as we go. So sixth graders are introduced to the basic food groups. Seventh grade gets a little more involved in um, how to apply that to your everyday cooking. And um, eighth grade gets more involved in 
Uh, we covered it just the other day. New nutrients, and also we get into the farm to table philosophy. And lastly, food preparation, which most of them are all looking forward to the most and ask every day is today a cooking day. Um, and each grade, again, we get a little more um, advanced as we go through the years, starting with the basics with sixth grade and moving up to some pretty, pretty technical cooking uh, terms and techniques. So I'd like to introduce first, um, we're going to talk about each one of these areas quickly, our um, consumerism and, and financial literacy portion um, my sixth graders. I have um, Milani, Boy, and Parisha, Ramesh. Girls. If you want to look up. Um, so we learned how to be a wise consumer and how to spend our money and how much to spend, how much to save, and how much to give to charity. So that'll help us when we get older and make decision, make bigger decisions. I have a question for you. Is Dorothy your sister? Yes. <laughs> that was the first of two questions. Is it easier because she's not here or harder? Mm. Both. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, That's a, That's a nice. Come on up to the microphone, please. Yeah, thank you. FCS helped us with learning about our wants and needs, like if I probably might need clothes, but what type of clothes it is, because like I might need clothes, but I don't need Gucci clothes. <laughs> do you guys, when you do this, do you use any computer programs, or how do you um, how do you do these exercises? Um, yes, I actually did one on the wants and needs. We learned about how to spend our money, and then we got to look up one item, and how much the price was. And I was looking up a cat. So do you get a budget? Do you get a certain amount of money that you're allowed to spend? I don't know. They just said, they just um, said like to write down the warranty and We also learned about different advertising techniques and how companies try to make us buy their product. Like, there are so many. <laughs> we learned about 16. There's one about impulse buying. Yeah. Impulse buying? Oh, tell me about that. <laughs> like when you walk into a store and then you see something that you weren't planning on buying and it's, and oh, it's, it's a thing. want and you're like, ooh, I want to buy that. <laughs> It happens to everyone. <laughs> so, so if I'm at Stop and Shop and I'm about to check out, where might I find some impulse buys? Where do they put them? Um, usually when you're like at the register, mm -hmm. there's like magazines, candy, snacks, sodas. <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups are there, I'm just saying. <laughs> Um, so basically, those are mostly our skills that we learned about it, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'd like to have a um, couple of our eighth graders, um, Brandon Klein and Alyssa Mikowski, and they're going to tell you a little bit about our program and how we are able to incorporate um, our consumerism portion with our uh, junior achievement program. So JA is a program that teaches us like to prepare um, for like the real world once we get out of school. And so JA comes, um, a, someone from JA comes to us um, every Friday for six weeks and they talk with us about like to prepare for the real world. And um, the JA people that come, they're volunteers, which, so they're volunteering and it's a nonprofit organization, so they're just volunteering to teach us about these things. 
Um, every year there's different focuses on what you learn in JA. So, for instance, in sixth grade, preparing for the work, working world while still in middle school. In seventh grade, applying entrepreneurial skills to education, career, and, ser and service pursuits. And in eighth grade, you focus on personal finance and identifying education and career goals based on your skills, interests, and values. And every week, JA volunteers, they have a fun way to um, engage you into learning so it makes it fun while you're still learning about what you will do in the real world. Thank you very much. And next, um, we have our seventh grader, Judy Bell, here to talk about a little about what the, um, seventh grade has been doing in the world of cooking. Um, in seventh grade, one of the things you get to make are healthy pumpkin muffins. Um, and also in seventh grade, you focus on measuring instead of the nutrition or the other stuff you learn in sixth grade. Um, so you have to like, be really precise with the measuring because otherwise, we've made this recipe twice in my group the first time the entire dough was liquid. But when we made it today, it wasn't, so they should be fine. <laughs> so there's no direct sugar in the recipe, which makes it a lot healthier, and it still tastes fine. So that's. <laughs> um, we also have to split up the jobs evenly with our groups. So one person will add the vegetable oil, and the next person will add the maple syrup, and then the next person will add the eggs, and so on. Um, and for this recipe, we had two teams, dry and wet teams, just so that it went a little bit faster. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, we'd like you guys to sample. We have recipes that we brought to. Um, so I think this did questions? not come out. But are there any? But we can start passing things out and answer questions. And there are about thirty people in the room, so I think we're we are. They are. Questions, comments from the board. Any questions? I have a quick question, Ms. Marti. Do you repeat the finance literacy portion after sixth grade? It, it changes. Um, for sixth grade, again, it's more of a focus on introducing them to finance in the most basic form. Yeah. Um, I think one of the students talked about saving, spending, and giving. We kind of focus on that. And then I lead them into the advertising portion, how to recognize advertising techniques. Thank you. Um, mentioned how they um, do a little research on the computer. They pick a... Uh, something they'd like to buy under five hundred dollars, and then search search the net for the best price, um, the best quality for that price. Um, seventh grade, we get a little more involved in the production model. Uh, when you put human capital and uh, natural resources together, what you can come up with, a good or a service, and then we turn that into the entrepreneur side of things. If you are going to be a business owner, what would you like to produce, or what would your service be? And JA ties in awesome with that, that whole um, entrepreneurship. Eighth grade, we focus more on careers and rights and responsibilities of consumers, so it does change. Um, and again, JA, with that portion, uh, does a lot of finance and, and budgeting for them for the first time, introducing them to how credit cards work, and um, you're given a certain amount of money a month, how are you gonna live on that? So that's kind of how we progress through the three years. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, in which grades um, do you um, does the farm to table fall into eighth your grade? Curriculum? This year we did it. I started in eighth grade. Yeah. And and are you working with the the um, this little um, planting area that we have outside? I hope to. Yeah, I hope to somehow get involved with that. Okay. Yeah, that'll be great. Do the kids meet um, all year round with you, or is this like half a year class? I have I have them for 45 days, every day for a quarter. So it's a quarterly class, 45 days total. Any other questions? Not a question, but Mr. Cranberg and I did go judge last year. We did a little shark tank to meet Mr. Cranberg in the Stardust class, and it was pretty it was pretty great. So it was a lot of fun to be able to see what these the ideas that the kids came up with for a business and how they pitched it and made their slides for a pitch presentation. So it was really nicely done. 
Well, thank you for the healthy pumpkin muffin recipe, and thank you for presenting tonight, everyone. We always love to see the students in schools in the spotlight. Swing by the back of the uh, middle school. They just finished the fencing on the garden. It looks really great. It, it looks really great. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Maritha, welcome. We did not start without you. We met Thank your you sister so tonight. <laughs> um, so, student representative reports, Maritha and Jack. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so today, uh, students took the PSATs at the high school. Um, I think that went, for the most part, okay. All right. <laughs> You'll find out. Right. Um, the homecoming dance uh, at the high school is this Friday, the 18th at 7 p.m., 7 to 10 p.m. Um, the DECA Fall Leadership Conference will be next week. That is the 22nd. It will be a school day field trip for students who are both already members of DECA and those who are interested in learning more about what DECA, the business club, is. Um, there will also, the 22nd has quite a few events, so in addition to the DECA Fall Leadership Conference, uh, we also have the Blood Drive, the student government uh, run Blood Drive on the 22nd, as well as NHS Induction, um, that'll be at 6 p.m. for um, new members of NHS. The Model UN trip to New York City, the annual trip, will be on the 24th, which is again next week, next Thursday, and uh, the NHS Bake Sale, um, which will be benefiting empty, uh, the Empty Bowls Fund, um, will be on uh, October 26th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in front of Geisler's. Uh, we will be selling a variety of baked goods, so if you can drop by, please feel free to do so. Um, the Fall Coffee House will be on Saturday, November 23rd. It has been postponed from the Friday prior due to a football game, which was in conflict with the Coffee House. Um, and now the auditions for Coffee House will be on November 1st and November 4th. Uh, the last SAT for most seniors, if they were uh, going to be taking them for the college application uh, season, truly begins for most, uh, will be on November 2nd, Saturday, November 2nd. Thank you. Quick question. Do you know what Empty Bowls is going to be yet? Uh, okay. I don't know. I no. don't have an exact date yet, but okay. March. Thank you. Yes. Jack? Um, in terms of athletics and the sports programs, our girls' field hockey team is undefeated with eight wins, and their play for the Cure fundraiser going to um, cancer research has raised $1,123 as of yesterday. Our girls' soccer team is now undefeated with 10 wins. Our girls' volleyball team is 9-3. and three. They had their game today, and that was their dig, dig pink game, which was their way of fundraising for breast cancer awareness. And our boys and girls cross country have their champ, uh, conference championship game tomorrow at Bolton at 1 p.m. Our boys' soccer team is now 8-1-1, one, and, one, and boys' football is 4-1 and one, with their next game being homecoming 10-25 against a co-op of Windsor Lock, Suffield, and East Granby. All of our sports teams are in the top three for the conference. Um, I don't know if you all got a chance to see it. The Hartford Current did a feature on our own cross-country runner, Lizzie Capelli, who I heard her name mentioned earlier. So um, if you haven't had a chance to read that article, it's really quite something about an amazing young woman. So, all right. Any questions, other questions, comments for our student reps? Thank you. Moving on to public comment. If you're a member of the public, you want to address the board, come up, tell us who you are, where you live, and what's on your mind. So welcome. Hi, Todd Klein, 27 Strawberry Fields Road. This is real quick, but as a parent of a middle school student, and just hearing their update, um, middle school dances tend to be sometimes the same night as home football games. And when the middle school kids are coming out of the dance, just so you're aware, it is a tremendously dangerous situation. So I know there's other middle school parents. My son's in eighth grade. It's not going to affect me much longer. But hearing when the homecoming football game is and knowing when the dance is, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So maybe there could be, in the future, more coordination when the middle school dances are on Friday nights. They're not the same night as a home football game. Thank so. you. Any other members of the public? 
Welcome, Kim. Hi, Melissa. Uh, Kim Becker, I'm at 149 Lima Street in North Granby. Um, I just wanted to uh, very briefly say that um, I understand ex uh, how much work all of you put into our community and our schools. I really appreciate that. Um, whether it's the subcommittees that you know you attend before this meeting, whether it's uh, the late start or the equity task force or the building committees, you guys are incredibly involved. I would like to just uh, say that the superintendent search is clearly the most important thing that you will do for this community. And thank you for the time that you've put into it. Um, I would really love to see a, a new superintendent who is curriculum focused, who is uh, all about program evaluation and developing a kids can culture here in Granby. Um, we're going to hear about the test scores later this evening. I think we can all agree they're not where we would like them to be. And uh, I think a, that your work uh, finding the right superintendent for our community is going to be the turning point. And I appreciate the work you're putting in, and I hope that you will really find the right person who has our academic interests at heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public want to come up and tell us what's on your mind? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the consent agenda. Can I have a motion? I'll move that the Granby Board of Education adopt the consent agenda. I'll second. Discussion? We only have, sometimes we have more than one item on, um, so it's just the minutes this week. No discussion? Seeing none, I'm calling for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passes. There is no old business to report, so we move along to new business. First reading of policy 6111, which involves, I believe, graduation date because yeah. of a change in the statute. Right, and it just reflects the statutory change. I think it gives the district more flexibility in terms of identifying what that date is. Any questions about the... So it will move to the second reading at the next regularly scheduled board meeting. Chris, annual district testing report. This is a uh, more in-depth look of uh, what the achievement gap report um, started to show last uh, at last board meeting. Um, so we'll have a, a look into our smarter balanced performance, um, grade 12 SAT, 11 SAT, and our AP testing. Uh, so to start, is this a little blurry to you? It's a little blurry. Um, just let me ask you a point of order. Um, do you, I'm presuming because there's a lot of, I've reviewed this document before um, it was presented, it was part of the agenda. Do you want questions free form from the board before we move on from pages or you tell me? I think it might be helpful to hear some of the strategic actions first okay. um, and then I'm going to stop at that slide and I'm just anticipating some of the questions so I can refer to those other slides. I'm not going to go through all of them. They're for the for your information. Okay, does that make that sense to everyone sense. on the board? <laughs> so with SBAC, um, there was uh, the green path, the blue path, and the pink path are diagonals that represent the cohort performance of those students. So when we look at our ELA, um, we had a cohort growth from, when we look at our fourth grade cohort, fifth grade cohort, um, sixth and seventh. Um, so there was some growth there. Our average performance grew from 73.5 to 76. Um, and this is a big area of focus last year. We, we put a lot of our resources professional development wise into some external PD with a consultant to really focus on ELA. And ELA was also our focus for um, curriculum revision this year since we uh, underwent math 
a few years back. So ELA has been the focus for the past couple of years, uh, and we are seeing some growth in those areas. Um, with the math piece that I'm going to go to on the next slide, um, I would say the first piece is um, these math scores are not where we want them to be. And the other piece that is where we've been spending a lot of our time is we're talking about the same group of kids. Um, when we're comparing our ELA scores to those math students, um, there's some surprising gaps in how those students have achieved. So here when we look at math, um, and I'll go to the bottom right hand corner, the pink, so we have, that's 52% of students at meeting grade level expectation. And in the previous slide, we had 80% of those same students meeting grade level expectation. So when we see disparities like that, um, there's something that we go to right away and it's called the instructional core. The three parts of the instructional core are the students, the teachers, and the curriculum. Something has to be wrong with one of those three things. Being in the education business, we don't say anything's wrong with the students because it's our job to teach them. So then we have to say, is something happening with instruction or is something happening with the curriculum or is it a combination of both of those things? Um, so we definitely have a lot of work to do with the curriculum as our first point of entry. Um, and a big piece of that is when we write new curriculum, there's this expectation that teachers are now going to teach the new curriculum. Um, so there's often expectations on teachers to do something new when we're not necessarily providing them with the tools that they need to do that new thing well. Um, so those are the two things that are working together. And when you see the strategic actions later, um, I'll speak to those uh, more clearly. So with math, there was some cohort growth from grade six to seven, um, so 64 to 71. Um, it's the highest performance of that seventh grade cohort over time. Um, and I'll point out in the slide later on that that seventh grade cohort is the first it's the first cohort of students that piloted the Eureka program. So when those students were in fourth grade, they were the pilot grade level for Eureka. They also have the highest performance on um, SVAC. I can't say that's a direct correlation, but it's one that I have to name uh, nonetheless. Um, the average performance uh, from year to year is actually for, it's pretty much the same. So if we're talking about it's a 62.2 to a 62.5, um, it's pretty stable performance, but as we see, um, we're slipping in the dirt in several grade levels. Um, even though we're performing consistently, it means that some districts around us, comparable districts, have um, higher achievement scores or making improvements that we did not make. Um, we did have improvement in dirt standing in grades five and seven with math. Um, I'll shift to AP. Um, AP is pretty, it's a pretty interesting thing that's happening right now. So our performance is good. Um, everything is pretty stable. Um, really strong performance in our new courses, which was the AP CompSci principles and the capstone courses that we've added. Um, but the challenge that we're facing is there are multiple paths for students now to receive college credit for things. So when you hear dual enrollment, those are our AP courses that students might also be dual enrolled with ECE at the same time. Um, many families and students are making a choice to, yes, we'll take the dual enrolled class and we will take the ECE, ECE exam uh, and then no thank you on the AP exam. Um, one of the things we look at is AP exam completion um, and that definitely impacts our stats and how we've evaluated our AP performance over time and also we're standing with the college board and what they call the college readiness index. So that's putting us in an interesting spot and it will continue to uh, because there's no magic solution to this because we're looking to increase opportunities for students beyond just AP um, to determine college readiness and, and, and their partnerships to do that. Does that make sense? I know it's a lot of What's considered passing for an AP, a three year more? A three year more, okay. yeah. And, and I can't really read the bar, like bar the graphs, um, the gray, the yellow, and the brown. Which uh, so the gray is graduates that passed at least one AP course. Um, the golden color is AP students that took at least one AP exam. And then the brown is AP students that passed at least one AP exam. Um, the point of me providing some of that background is um, I think we want to revisit how we're presenting this uh, part of the information in the future, because if you think about our equity report last week, um, we're talking about college readiness in a different way. So we look at AP in isolation for this, but we look at college readiness in a different way um, for AP. So it's, it just causes some interesting conversation and to be quite honest, a little bit of confusion in how we talk about college, like college readiness in two different reports. 
Chris, is there financial assistance for students who who want to take an AP test but maybe can't afford? Yes, yes, they can petition for. So assistance. we're not having kids opt out of the AP exam. Yeah, and that's more often than not. It's not. It's not the financial assistance. It's the why am I going to pay to take this exam if I've taken the ECE exam and I have credit from UConn already to take this course. So that's what we're running into more than anything else. On the on this slide here, we are aggregating all 18 of our AP courses. Is that is that how I'm reading this? Yes. Okay. Would it be possible to break it out by AP course, and or could you just tell us are there courses that are notable for either their high pass rate or their not so high pass rate? Um, I would say the for me some notables of um, not high it would be in the social studies area um, for a high pass rate that gets a big shout out is AP Calc BC in the first the first year of it being a course offering that was not virtual um, all students in the class received a three or higher which is one of the most competitive exams um, but I have that I can send you that very easily to break down of all of those. So can I ask her, maybe you don't want to answer this question now or answer it at all. So how can that be? So how can the students in the lower classes performance in math be going down and then they get into high school and they're doing extremely well in AP Calc exams? Yeah, and that's been, um, so the, the good story over the years has been, it's a happy ending with our students do well on their SAT achievement. Um, but we've seen this fluctuation happening and from a stats lens, some volatility in grade level performance. And a lot of it has to do with curriculum implementation. And I'll, I, I made a grid that I'll show you in a bit that is either going to be very confusing or very helpful. And you can let me know. And if it's not helpful, I'll never do it again. Doritha. I'd also like to note that the Calc, B, the Calc BC class last year that I was in had 13 students and all 13, well, the seniors, so 11 out of 13 of them were all in the top 10% of the class as well. So AP Calc BC is a measure of the already high achieving students' achievement in mathematics. So that needs to be noted. And as expected, because AP Calc AB is another option, right? Yes. And moving on to this year, the class only has five students, so, I mean, that is, yeah. So what do you guys tell me? My assumption is wrong that people aren't really catching up? That um, no, it's just that the top of the, like, grade, I guess, uh, skill-wise, are the students that are taking this course, so they're expected, or they're expecting themselves going into the test oh, that they're going to pass. Because, I mean, five students in a AP, BC, Calc, class compared to the 21 that are in just my honors pre-calc class. It's, um, and it's, it's not surprising to me that, that the pass rate was three or higher, like 100% for the BC Calc class last year, because seeing the consistent achievement of these students in that class, like it's not surprising at all that, that the pass rate is so high. There, there, a few years ago, I know we used to have close to 50 kids in like AP Calc, um, AV, not BC, obviously, because we didn't offer it. Um, how do we compare now to just how many kids are actually in AP Calc, AB, or BC? I don't have that at my fingertips, but I can get that to you. Um, there was also a change in calculus honor structure last year that. Right you asked to be reported on in the fall, so we can look at that. I mean, and that could be one of the explanations, is that even though the pass rate is maintaining itself in AP, it depends on how many kids are actually taking the math. So a weakness in math could be masked by there's not as many kids actually taking AP Calc. Um, and, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so. Shifting to, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can I just make one more note about the AP classes? Uh, I'd also like to note that there are only seven students in the AP Physics class this year, including myself. Um, the AP Stats class, five students, BC Calc, very, very small. I, I feel, and, and the Chemistry class, of course, has consistently been less than 15 students AP Chemistry. So I wear yes in English and uh, Social Studies classes. My AP class last year, there were two sections. Each section had 22 to 24 kids each. It, like, and my English classes, they're always 
consistently one or more, like two full um, class periods offered for, for the humanities and English and social studies courses rather than STEM courses. Science and math AP, uh, AP courses are consistently, as far as what I've seen, very low enrollment. Are you saying the low enrollment is because of the scheduling of the classes and the sections, or? I don't think, no, no, that's definitely not it. People aren't showing enough interest in those high-level STEM classes. I mean, building off Dory Ted, what she experienced last year, since I'm not taking those courses this year, there are four full class periods of the AP U.S. History and three full of the um, AP English, so it's actually increased from what you were saying last yeah. year, mm -hmm. but I believe the math has decreased. I have lots of comments, but I'll hold them. I'm <laughs> sure Mr. Dunn's taking some notes. Well, there is no, like, just for that point in terms of the comparison with the AP, AP Lang and the junior year, there is no honors langu language, is that right? 11 honors. Yes. There's only, well, in, like, it's academic, AP or academic, academic and then There is, but it does not run due to no enrollment. Enrollment. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'd just like to correct myself. The BC Calc, I confused that with AP Stats. That actually has a little more than 10 students. BC, or AP Stats has five students this year. Come on, you don't know that stuff up in your head. What, what? <laughs> Did you just get a live text no. message? <laughs> I just, I realized no, that was uh, I, I don't want to disrupt because you said that you were going to, you had an action sheet, but is it going to speak to the three, four, five, grades three, four, five, um, math, SBAC? Um, yes, yeah, so, so it'll have some. Because I have a question about that, but I, I don't want to get ahead of. Well, you, Let me do yeah. this and see if I don't right. answer it, then we can dig okay. in to, to those. Um, so with SAT, we'll look at it two ways. So the first is with the super score. So this is the class of 2019. Um, so we have an aggregate performance over 1,100, which is the, the benchmark that we've used as a, a competitive score. Um, so we had an 1,141, um, which is down from the previous two years. Um, but when you look to this next slide, um, the SAT test day, if you look at 2018, those are the same students who performed consistently in that same band. So the students that are 2018 uh, in this slide, so this is the first four represent uh, math SAT and then ELA SAT um, are, the, are the same group in uh, 2019. So basically you're saying that that group 2018 gained on their super score. Yeah, so the cohort is, and you'd expect that super score to be higher than the test today, um, but you're like, well, why is it lower than the year before? Then you kind of compare it to, well, what was it like those other years? Um, so they're performing to scale. So there's a, it's a reliable performance of how they do, whether it's super score or the SAT day, is my point. And for, for the SAT, do we have um, a sense as to where we are in the DERG for both super score and SAT day? Yes. Um, no, super score we don't and we can't because we can't get super score for all the other districts. But for SAT day, I'll give that to you right now. Um, in ELA, we are 6 out of 19, which is an improvement from the previous year. In math, we are 15 out of 19, and that is also an improvement from the previous year in our Dirk standing. Um, something that we will have is um, more College Board data. There's nothing that's a better predictor of SAT performance than other assessments that the College Board provides. Um, so now that we're part of the PAP program, we do have some additional access to data that could be helpful in making those decisions. With the um, test day uh, data, um, we did have 84.8% of our students at goal for ELA, so that is a celebration. Um, and those are just some breakdowns of that test. So for this cohort of students, they did perform higher than the cohort the year before, um, but that 
2017 cohort, which was the class of 2018, um, was our highest achieving group on SAT, historically. So there's not been much movement in SAT, despite the difference uh, that we've seen with performance in math, especially um, with SBAC. Um, so this is um, a, an extensive list, and I'll, I'll go through these and then uh, take some of the questions, and you might be able to get to some of those with the backup slides that I have. Um, so a big part of this, as I mentioned, is the implementation of new curriculum. Um, so as you know, math was new not too long ago uh, because I was replaying it. I remember my first year here is when Eureka was the approved instructional resource. Um, and we did a somewhat um, methodical rollout. And I am going to advance just to show you that grid that I mentioned before. So um, in 2016, you see grade four has a yellow bar. Um, so that's the group that has had implementation of Eureka the longest. So if you go diagonally, four, five, six, seven, um, in 2019, so that's the 2019 data that you see, that is who's had the most exposure to the Eureka instructional resources. Um, in fiscal year 2017, we rolled out the curriculum with grades three, four, and six. And then in 2018, we added K1, two, and three. In 2019, we made a shift with um, trying to move to uh, using the instructional resources as the primary tool because what we had done is we wrote some new curriculum um, and we brought in this new tool that did not necessarily interface with the workshop uh, model that was in place with math before, so workshop and stations. Um, so we dismantled that and so there was another shift. Um, the point being that if we stuck with this as things are, we wouldn't really see the full results of Eureka implementation until 2026. Um, and I know some shifts that we're making already because this is a curriculum revision year for math that we won't really see those until 2028. And that would be if the new curriculum, the, those curriculum adjustments get made. And with that said, there's two more revisions within that cycle because it's a four year cycle. The reason that I'm saying this is we are very quick in education to decide something is not working and make a quick pivot to something else. And we know for sure, it's research-based, that there are, there's something called an implementation dip. When you implement new curriculum, you do see a dip. Um, so a lot of this is expected, but at the same time, a lot of it's not acceptable because we have 80% of students in ELA, 52% of students in math, something's not adding up there that, that we can certainly address and not wait until 2028 to see the results. So please don't think I'm saying, just give it till 2028 and we'll be fine. Um, I think as soon as we roll out the new curriculum with the revisions after next year, that'll be the biggest gain that we see. Um, but there's been a lot of transition, especially in people in my position. And with new people in these positions are come different thoughts and beliefs on how curriculum should work. Um, and shifts happen as a result of, of the leadership transition there. Sorry. Can I just ask a quick question? Absolutely. The, um, you know, when you're comparing with our DERG and whatnot, and we're obviously full on with the Eureka Math, what are the other schools in our DERG? Are they using Eureka Math? Are they doing everyday math? Is that what we used to use with the everyday? Yes, yeah, once upon a time. Uh, Bridges is pretty, you look at most districts, and Bridges is probably the most competitive to Eureka. Um, the math coach has sent me today the pro con list of why Eureka was chosen over Bridges. Um, Eureka goes through the middle school, Bridges does not. Um, Eureka was much more standards aligned and Bridges does not. Um, and But the, what we're seeing now is, okay, then what's the problem? It's like, yes, Eureka standards aligned, but it talks about those same standards in different ways than um, SBAC does. So yes, it's testing, but it's relying on a high level of transfer. So that's good because we actually teach for transfer. That's the ultimate goal of education. Um, but are we expecting too much transfer for students at the stage that they're taking these tests is the, is the question. And this is actually a question. It's going to sound ridiculous when I say it. But 
I know a lot of parents don't understand the math that their kids are doing. So I'm sure as you've seen the increase of Eureka math, you've seen a decrease of parental health because I know I'll stare at what my kids are doing and I just, it's, and you see posts on Facebook and everything of like how, I don't understand how this works. So is there, I mean, I guess it's just speculation, but is there any correlation with that at all that one could assume? Yeah, so I ran my, I ran some of my thoughts by the, coaches and I've talked to some admins and something that came up today was exactly that thing of can we create um, opportunities to educate the parents on what this should look like at home because you're right if these are strategies that are not the standard algorithm um, it's really hard to help and it actually from all of the math that I see I think it's harder in K through three than it is when you get through fourth and higher. Right. Because the strategies are much less traditional because it's really about building that number sense and understanding place value so you have that skill for life. Like you're not carrying a one when you're adding. No, like you are know. lassoing, you are yeah. number lining, you are number tapes, you are number bonding. You're doing things that were not part of the way that most of us learn math. And that doesn't make them bad that they're different, but it is different and it is about building the number sense. So. We don't have just an operational understanding of when you see this, you do this, but you know what it means. Um, and that is something that takes willingness to learn. Um, and the, the suggestion that came from someone today is can we just make some, maybe even instructional videos of this is what we're working on, this is how the strategy works. Would that be a helpful thing? Does Khan Academy, because I know my kids are always on Khan, it, does it go as low as the third grader doing Eureka math? No. Not to my knowledge. Okay. I gotta say, I mean, I didn't realize that we'd kind of thrown out the standard algorithms with Eureka Math. We haven't. They're all there, but you also learn five to seven other strategies um, that this go along the way. This sounds so much like everyday math, and honestly, I, mean, I, I gotta say, I feel like maybe our problem is actually Eureka Math, and it wasn't actually there until we kind of just went through this. But teaching kids five to seven different ways of doing something, I mean, the reason why we have standard algorithms is because they work so consistently and efficiently. And there's a reason to teach them, which is to reduce confusion and to learn fluency of number handling. Um, and, and I'm, I'm not, I, now I'm like really starting to like, maybe this whole Eureka math thing is actually a really bad idea. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, this, it, it concerns me that there is less reliance on the standard algorithms, um, not because I'm a traditionalist, but because they work. Um, there's a reason they work, and why they work so efficiently, and why kids have, you know, for centuries managed to handle standard algorithms. And I know everyday math was big into, let's teach them three, four, or five different ways of doing it. It was a disaster. So and everybody abandoned it. And now it sounds like we're doing exactly the same thing with another name. So I'll do a, a, what we know for sure is the United States has slipped in NAEP performance as a result of a, tradition, a traditional standard algorithm approach to teaching mathematics. That is pretty uniquely the way did we you, do things. Did you say NAEP performance? Yeah, so that's the, that's the national assessment that we're compared to when we hear the United States is slipping in performance. And we, I think we've, we've been NAEP tested every year. We've been part of the the group that's pulled. Um, so I know there's comfort in it, and there's comfort in being able to help. Um, but I can say it's appropriate, and at the time when we need to focus on the algorithm, um, that's when that shift happens. And when you can see kids in classes talk about and articulate strategies, their understanding of how numbers work is incredibly impressive. Um, but we have not given anything a chance to work. We, just, we shift so quickly uh, before we give it time. And I understand the edge. I just would, I would really hope that we wouldn't abandon. I, yeah, I'm not saying we should abandon Eureka right now, um, but I, I'm not as as confident at this point that it was the right idea um, as it was before, especially given how terrible our performance was. I mean, we are at or near the bottom of the derg in many grade levels. Um, and, and that's pretty disturbing, as I don't think we've ever been at the bottom of the derg quite as consistently in, in my memory of Granby. I mean, we're usually somewhere near the top. And we aren't at the top quartile in anything. 
Um, we're, we're barely in the top half. And, and, and most of it is 75% of our, our grade level is near the bottom. Um, and, and that makes me think we've got to, to really look at what we're doing. Uh, we've, we've had ASPEC many years. We've had Eureka now at least three years. That implementation dip, we should be past that. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what we're doing, but I mean, other school districts are dealing with the same thing we are. They had the ASPEC come in. They've also had to make curriculum revisions. They've had new standards. How come their kids are passing at such a higher rate than we are? Um, I, I, maybe we're too, I mean, one of the other things we've heard is that we're a little too spread thin. We've added lots of different programs, taken away some instructional time. That might be something to also look at. Um, like I say, I'm not ready to say let's throw out Eureka, but I'm also not ready to say let's let's just hang on and keep going because we've got some really big red flags right now. And I think there are some very actionable items and some more theoretical items. And so this came to Mark's question last night of what are the resources you need to do this? Um, they're not actually different than the comments about equity. Um, we need math interventionists. So we have our three, five building and our middle school that does not have a math intervention structure. And when we talk about SRBI, um, SRBI, um, we did some significant revisions to our processes, um, but you can only revise a process so much if you don't have the, the resource for them to go and receive that support. Because the idea is if a student needs math support, they need double the amount of instructional time. And if there's not a person to do that, then we can't give them that. So those are some immediate deliverables that I think you'll see prioritized in the budget, um, especially for math and at the middle school and Wells Road specifically. So um, to my point, and I get it's kind of segues, we saw, I want to say about a, a year or two ago at Wells Road, we had a, we had a math problem. Sure. And we deployed a lot of resources and um, put a very sharp focus on what was going on in the math at Wells Road. And, the and as a result, the following year, we actually saw some pretty significant gains. Um, and I don't know if it was an SBAC or if it was a different testing assessment that we were looking at, but we were actually pleased with the direction it was going, and now I feel like we've slipped backward. Am I uh, so I remember, remembering that correctly? You I are, mean, and I remember just because it was my first year in, and it was the year of the merger of the schools. So the 15-16 data, that's the year that you're referencing. Okay. So those scores right there represent the year that it felt like there were improvements. And when you compare them across, so you're looking, if you look at the third grade, so we had a 67% in 1516, and then a 68 in 1819, 67, 65, 65, and 63. Um, so there's one area where it's gone up, two where it's gone down, but those are not giant significant shifts of this is amazing improvement or this is a disaster what happened. Um, so that same year is the year you're talking about, and our scores don't look like they're from a different school um, or a different district at the time. I think the challenge has been how is, so this is a picture of kind of consistent performance as a district that our average scores are, are pretty stable, but why does it feel like the derg is slipping? And that's because one, others are improving where we're not, and two, when we talk about dipping in the derg, um, we should also look by how much we're dipping, because sometimes it's, we're not in a place because we are two tenths of a point apart. Um, we can go deeper with that too, but I'm at the risk of I don't want to sound defensive because I'm not trying to defend these scores as um, solid performance that's representative of our students because there's no way our students are 52% proficient in one content area and 80 in another. That's the, the most important message that I think we can, can say. And uh, I think if it hadn't been asked, um, do we ask um, I, I know you, we talked about Eureka versus Bridges that other DIRGs are doing. Have we kind of done a maybe a learning walk in other DIRGs to see how they're implementing their curriculum or some takeaways? So bef before I arrived, there were visits to other schools to look at both Bridges and Eureka. Um, since then, there were some visits last year or the year before to districts that were using Eureka. 
and those visits resulted in the shift of all right, we tried to make new instructional resources work with past practice, and those two things were not merging. So we said, we are not doing this anymore. We're gonna focus primarily on Eureka as the instructional resource. So Eureka is functioning as the curriculum. And so now we need to go to the next level and say, okay, the standards need to drive the curriculum, not what's next in the Eureka resource. And do we still do the workshop model for No. Matt? No, we don't do the workshop model in large part. Eureka, but one of the um, on the list, it does not align with the workshop model. So we were using workshop, which really means that every day students are doing. Um, there's new learning, there's the review learning, and then there's practice, um, which sounds nice in theory, but doesn't necessarily work, especially for students that don't need to practice the old math. They need to accelerate and be learning what's coming next. So the Eureka, as it is, is really well differentiated in design itself. Um, and a workshop model, this is my opinion that not everyone shares, does not serve math instruction well. I would hope that when we're going through our, our strategic actions that we put a lot of emphasis on talking to parents and teachers. Um, I think every teacher I know, if you ask them what's going on in your classroom and why are so few kids able to meet standard they'll probably be able to tell you. Um, I, 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 every teacher I've ever talked to has been able to articulate pretty clearly what they see is going on with the kids in their classroom, why they are or are not learning. Um, and, and I would hate to see a top-down approach and much rather see a bottom-up, that if we rely on the parent, the teachers and the parents the ones who are actually working with the kids and know what they're struggling with and why they're struggling, we're much more likely to come up with solutions. I agree. Really, it's my turn? So I have a question and I guess a couple comments. Um, back on the strategic actions, um, what? what? Why does the first bullet point start with talking about implementing new curriculum for ELA? So we're doing great in ELA and we're going to redo the curriculum? Is that what that means? Well, we're doing better in ELA. I would say we're not doing great. Um, but we had already revised our math curriculum where that's not going so well. So ELA was next on the cycle. So we just did ELA revision and this is the implementation of that curriculum. So, oh, I see. so what was happening is we had two different, um, the same overarching philosophy of ELA instruction happening between our elementary schools and what we did is we made a clear bridge between our elementary schools. That's what that speaks to most specifically. Okay. Um, and then I guess just some free-flowing comments that are in no particular order. To me, it's more important for us to set our goal, whatever we want our goal to be in terms of our, our percentage of kids meeting the, the standard. I'm not, I, I don't think we should lose too much sleep over where we stand in the dirt because of all the other things that are outside our control that are going on in the dirt. So to me, it's more important for us to set our standard. The second is I, I, did, I attended the middle school PAC meeting this morning and I, I, I was very, um, grateful and impressed by Sue's response because all we talked about was test scores. There was, a, there was a number of parents there who were concerned and had a lot of questions and I, I thought the way Sue handled it was, was very well done. It, it was no sugar coating. We have an issue here. It's tied almost directly to curriculum and we need to work on it and we need to fix it. But So I wanted to, to thank her for that. I also wanted to thank the parents who were there who came very, there. nobody was carrying torches and it was very, they came with ideas and suggestions and real questions. So I'm getting to my point. One of the things that came out of it that I thought was very helpful, um, just the dialogue between the parents and Sue was this notion that, that where they're gonna start sending out weekly emails on exactly what you were talking about to parents. What can you do as a parent 
to both learn how Eureka works and how we're trying to de de deliver that to students, how you can help with that, and it's different than the way you learn. So there's apparently some instructional videos that are already available to parents who can help them in that process. And then other creative ideas that parents can do. So I thought that was just a, a great thing. The other thing that came out of it for me that would not have, was not intuitive that I wouldn't unless Sue had pointed it out is, and I don't think we should lose sight of it as we're trying to figure out, digging really deep here, is that the other thing that's affecting some of the middle school students is the way we change the algebra curriculum. So we've pushed algebra curriculum down into the middle school, and so some of the, there is a chance that some of those students are being overloaded because they're being pushed algebra concepts before they fully mastered some of those other concepts that get tested. So I think as we do that, um, again, it made sense to me. I, I would hate to have us lose sight of making sure that we're looking at that as well. I'm not suggesting we change what we did. I'm just suggesting that we look at it to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So. And I don't want to lose sight of the 2015 math audit that happened and the math report and the math recommendations and connecting to the algebra, that algebra A, algebra B split of splitting that course um, was a decision that the curriculum subcommittee supported, I think it's two years ago, if not almost three, um, to address exactly that as well. To slow down yeah. for students. So question and then comment. So you've outlined for us what I call the look a new shiny thing way that we tend to approach education, right? And when I say we, I mean Connecticut, the Northeast. Um, we've talked about different kinds of math programs, and that's what I, that I don't, I'm going to put ELA over here. Um, how do you advise us as a board? Tell us, I see all these strategic actions, tell us in plain English, two things with regard to math. I know one's going to be resources, which I call, you know, bodies, because we talked about the three things you look at when something isn't working. Students, which we take out of the equation, teachers, and curriculum. So give the board your two recommendations um, as to what you would like to see, only with regard to math. In Chris's perfect world, um, I would say definitely, and I can include the human resource piece in these, or aside from those. So yes. the human resource piece is, I would say, the, the priorities for um, general education, the general education portion of the budget, um, because there are special education needs as well. And those special education needs very much reflect our overall achievement. If we have more special education students identified, we have more significant learning needs to address. So that's my caveat. So one would be an interventionist at the middle school and Wells Road for math specifically. Uh, and the second piece, again, when we have students performing with 52% proficiency, yes, interventions are a need, but the need is bigger. So it's called, it's tier one. What's happening in the classroom itself? Um, so just the support with our curriculum revision process that we are going through, it is taking longer than a lot of people want it to to revise curriculum, but we're not doing it hastily. And there's been, some people have experienced three, four, five, six curriculum revisions since they've been here. Um, it, but if you do it in a thoughtful way, it will be the quality that we need it to be. And EduPlan at 21, well, th that's our warehouse that we have now will support it. So number two is the resources to provide to support teachers professional development in the classroom they're so all student instruction both of them are resources yes so it's really the curriculum piece and the intervention piece those are the, the simplest way i can boil it down and the and the curriculum piece is the revision process that you're talking about yeah, and, uh, and I know, because I, I have the fear of the traditional algorithms, and I understand the safety that that has for many people, but our students will not be successful taking us back if they only know how to approach a math problem with the traditional algorithm. They're not even going to be able to unpack the problem, because there's so much reading that goes into the SBAC test. So from the time that we have the curriculum finalized to the point where you, you got it where you want it, how long should we reasonably expect before that gets reflected in test scores? Because there's not, there's not an immediate correlation, is there? Because you talked about the implementation dip. Yeah, so there's a dip. But this revision that we're going through, we're not talking about 
like blowing up the math curriculum and starting from scratch because we don't need to but we need to make sure we take a standards first approach to how we revise the curriculum and not a what's on the next page of eureka approach and so that's going to be the difference because SBEC is a standards based test so we get lots of criticism about we're teaching to the test Yes, we teach to tests because we teach to standards, and these high-stakes tests measure how well we have taught the standards. And we need to do a better job at making that live in the day-to-day -day curriculum so it doesn't feel like this giant pivot when it comes to testing time. Okay, so why, why wouldn't we have up there two very specific goals? The curriculum will be done by this date, and we would expect our scores to be here by this date because I always use too many words. <laughs> so the math curriculum revision is next school year starting June all the way through the following June. That's what's built into the cycle. They're, they'll be revising the curriculums. So we're, I guess, correct so, me if I'm wrong. So we're, we shouldn't sit here today and expect significant, significant increases based on curriculum changes if we're not gonna start writing the curriculum until June. Well, I would say significant increases it's hard to ever expect significant increases to spike. It's usually a gradual process of improvement. So I want to put that there, that next year you're not going from 52 to 75. It's, that's not a thing that usually happens. Um, but they will start next year with new units. So they're, they're writing as the year goes on. That's all that means. So they're not going through another year with the same curriculum. So when our kids take us back in March, what should we expect, if you can answer this question, when we're sitting here next year this time? That we're addressing everything we can with the resources that we have. So we're looking at where are the specific gaps and different areas of performance, how can we address them without having intervention us. So we're really looking at the tier one. And so we did revise our SRBI, that's our recommendation process to provide student supports. That was done, um, and we are gradually rolling that out. We are gradually making improvements to PLC. So we'll use all of those things because those are very much tier one, things that everyone does for all students, and we will use those structures to address these needs. And yes, you should see a difference, because like I said, when we have 52%, that's a tier one issue on top of students that need specific support. But do you think we could expect to see an improvement? Oh, absolutely. Even, even, because uh, if the revision process isn't supposed to take place until yes, there are June things that we can do before the curriculum overhaul happens. And uh, to Mark's point, is we have to have specific goals as to what that looks like. I want to underscore. Remember, I'm here with an outside pair of eyes. And, and, and having been a number of places. And I just want to support that at the finance uh, subcommittee meeting tonight, um, I said the very same thing. You need interventionists. And, and I want to underscore what Chris is saying. That's one, it's not the only, but it's one of the missing pieces here. Your general ed and your special ed, right? It's like you have your square peg or a round peg. Right, but you have kids in here, right? And if they're not really fitting here, they're going to end up here. But there, and and you you really need to have people in this day and age doing that. So you won't, it, in my belief, you may see some progress, but you don't have those interventionists this year. So I don't think you're going to see that. I might think you see that after a little bit more, because and and again, it just takes it. There are. There are kids who, you know, it's not just a program, it's, it's a matter of the way kids learn, right? And some kids need more intervention. And the fact of the matter is, is that in any given class, there are so many very learning styles and ways. The fact of the matter is, is that if, unless you have a person dedicated to working with kids, you know, that need math help in, in, in a focused way, I think you're doing a disservice to kids. So I am going to tell you right now, you're going to see that in, in, when it comes in your budget. They've already been put in, right? And I support them totally. Um, you know, I won't be here for the time of your full budget thing, but I want to let you know that I support wholeheartedly what Chris is saying. Can I just add one more thing to Rosemary's comment too of the what can you expect? Um, 
this sounds like a kind of a doom and gloom report tonight. There's a lot of good that's happening in our school district, and there's a lot of good that's in these reports as well. That reflects the hard work of teachers and students. Um, to that point, um, I'm reading a great book. Keep do a plug, Switch, Heath and Heath. If you haven't read Switch, please read Switch. Um, but the second chapter talks about finding the bright spots. So we often work from a deficit model when we go in to make improvements. We think we know what's wrong, we diagnose the problem, and we start addressing those things that we think we know are wrong, instead of looking at what's going well and what's right. Um, so we do have a teacher in a grade that did not have impressive performance, but all students were at grade level. So you bet we're spending time learning from, well, what happened in that classroom, because that's a bright spot. And there has to be something happening with instruction because they have the same curriculum as every everyone else, right? So we're not saying it's the curriculum in that room because they did the same thing, but that something there was something there, um, and it wasn't just the magic of that person must have had all of these brilliant students. It's not the case. Um, so looking at the bright spots and learning from the good that's happening is an important way to focus our work as well. Probably the I, most important. I mean, I, I have some anecdotal, uh, you know. It, information that I'd like to share with you offline um, of a, a very you know positive result that I'm just trying to think in my head as you're talking how do you scale that that experience that resulted in a very you know very high score to a lot to, to include all students and it may be people that may be the, the linchpin the having having a person dedicated to do the, doing the work. Chris, it also sounds like what you're talking about is um, a need for PLC time. I mean, the, the whole theory is that if a teacher is knocking it out of the park, that the others in their group should you know, learn from them and they should share their own ideas. Are we giving enough PLC time to our teachers so that our successes can be shared amongst the team? Um, so the first part, the practical answer is it might not be more time, but using the time that we have as efficiently as possible. But the second part to that answer, when we compare it to Finland, which is everyone's favorite country to compare to in the United States, teachers have about seven hours a week of collaboration time. That's not prep time or anything else. It's with their colleagues where they're in what we call PLC, and we're looking more at 25 minute chunks, 45 minutes an hour. So it's a very different model, different philosophy, but absolutely, because how do you diffuse good practice without talking about what your good practice is? What, um, what role, if any, are the teaching coaches um, playing in this? Because I know that was something that was new last year. Did this teacher who had those great results have um, the coach, use the coach that, that year? I'm just curious. That, so, so the coaches weren't new, the model was new last year. So this is year two of implementation of the student-centered coaching model. Um, so one of the goals of all of the coaches was to actually increase, we do individual coaching and team coaching, um, so we want more. Um, that's certainly part of the goal. That teacher did not go through a traditional cycle. Um, but the coach was very aware of what was happening in that room. And I can give you one thing that was happening was that that technology that you supported that was aligned with Eureka that we were piloting last year, that teacher used it more than anyone else and used the data as formative assessment to make decisions about what kids needed. And so that's makes sense, right? You know how students are doing and you target their needs based on how they're performing day to day. It's what we know, but at the time to do that's pretty challenging when you have 60 students in fourth grade in math or 50 students. Are we using um, teachers specialized in math all the way down to third grade? Right now, we have, this is our third third year of the teacher partnerships at Wells Road. Right. How many and teachers do we have like in, in, at a grade level? How many are focused just on math? Um, two or three. Two or three. We have a time for a couple more comments. I know Toritha, Mark, and then I have one. This is just a curiosity question, but do you think that this lack of, I guess, achievement in math at the middle school uh, or elementary level is like, could be a potential reason why there are less, like there's less interest in general at the high school level for enrollment in higher level uh, math and science classes? Like is it, it's, I feel like it's something that is, might start over there in the lower lower grade levels and then nothing is being done even at the high school level to like 
raise students who are at a lower performance level up in GMAT? That's a good question, and I'll, I'll step back from just Granby. I'll talk to my experience in education. And I think that we have a math is hard philosophy in our culture that we perpetuate day by day, um, intentionally or not, from every person, especially females, that say, I'm not good at math. Um, that's that doesn't help what we're trying to do, right? Um, and we need people like you're a math you're a math science person. That's how I see you, and that's how I know you because you're on the steam committee, right? Um, it's important to have powerful voices and influential voices um, saying it's math. Math's not hard. Everyone can do math. Um, but so society look at TV the, the way that math is portrayed. Um, that's a huge problem that we can't underestimate how much it pervades our culture. So we need. We need math champions. So, to speak. so, so many of my friends. Like, I feel like maybe this is probably going off on a real tangent here, but just really quick, maybe like we could improve that kind of like math is kind of fun kind of thing with like more math-based extracurricular activities. I think that we can, like that's probably. I think a you have an agenda me. because I think that came up in your comments last <laughs> last week as well, <laughs> and in the steam committee. Right. No, yes. but yeah, I was just wondering. Thanks for everything. Mark, did you have a comment? You know, just, just, there was a method to my madness on the questions that I asked, because I, I do think there's a real risk in us making changes too quickly and then you know, going further backwards, right? So I really do think that we ought to try to set specific goals and so that we know as a board and we can help our constituents understand what our specific goals are and how we get there. because. You know, I'm, I've been doing this six years, and so it's taken me that long to understand we're not going to go from 52 to 70, right? We need to understand that. We need to understand how we're going to get to 70 and what the steps are and be very specific so we can measure each year whether we're getting there. That, that's, I would personally like to see a little more of that. This is our goal. Next year, our goal, whatever it is, 55, whatever it is. So but it's achievable, and we can tie it back to something we specifically did that we thought was going to get us those three points. So. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> um, you talked, this is my final comment. Um, you talked about teaching to the test as if, you know, that's a, a bad thing. And I just wanted to say that I have a different view on that um, and I think we should look at it as teaching the skills to pass the test because passing tests are necessary going to Mark's point just now of let's set a concrete goal if we need to be at X next year this is what this is our goal this is where we need to be um, we all have to take tests in life you have to take a driver's license test you have to take a you know, board exam, if you want to be in the medical profession, you have to take a bar exam if you want to be in the law. I, I don't think that teaching to the test should be necessarily a dirty word in education. That's just my opinion. Um, and finally, I want to thank you, Chris, because you deliver these results in whatever you do and in, in curriculum based in a way that is understandable. You're always prepared. Um, and I think I speak for the board when I say we all appreciate that. And, and your transparency and your, if you don't know it, you tell us and you always follow up with an action plan. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Miscellaneous Board Standing Committee reports. Curriculum, policy, technology, and communication did not meet, I know. Uh, finance, personnel, and facilities. Mark and I met. Um, we did not constitute a quorum, but I'll let him take you through what we talked about, and we took no action. Um, yeah, all, really all we did was review the, in any detail the statement of accounts that Anna has already presented. We had a very brief conversation of where we are in our long-term uh, capital. Um, so, and we didn't take any action on any of those things. Thank you. Craig and Cave. Oh, that's me. <laughs> So we met with Craig today, really um, nothing worth noting. There's a lot of administrative stuff, approving new policy revisions and so forth. Um, just another reminder that the, the uh, legislative breakfast is scheduled for February 20th. So don't have that on your calendars already. Um, go ahead and put them on the calendar. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Grammy Education Foundation. Jenny and Brandon are not here tonight, but we are still actively looking for someone to serve as a liaison from the board to the GEF. Um, I know all of us volunteer a lot, um, and the board is a lot, but still looking for that warm body to serve that important function. So Jenny has been attending when she can. Um, calendar of events, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Go if you can. If you have a student there, great. Uh, Mark is attending the NHS induction ceremony on October 22nd yes, on behalf of the board. Um, and again, no school on November 5th, professional development. Board member announcements? Students, any announcements? Board members, student board members, any announcements? Action items, Rosemary? So that's, I'm looking through all the notes that I took. Fix the test score. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one particular action item that um, Lynn asked. I'm just trying to find it in my notes, but I will, and I'll make sure Lynn has it. Um, it was the AP test score breakdown. By course. By yeah. course. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Um, on the calendar events, um, it says that the fall coffee house is on the 22nd. It has been postponed to the 23rd. Yeah. Right. 22nd is the football game. And do we have a way of advertising that when they get, uh, I mean, outside of this calendar events, it's updated on the school's website, I'm sure? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't have any need for an executive session or non-meeting and barring a motion. I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming.